So I've put a full version of the paper on the, uh, I've sent in, so I'm going to sort of talk to it rather than going through it in detail. Um, so apologies if you haven't read the paper, but you should be able to get hold of it later. Um, and I hope what I say will, will make sense anyway. So what, I'm, what I wanted to do in the paper was to think about the, sort of the pros and cons of the question of whether a, the creation of a duty of reasonable accommodation would provide some sort of an answer to some of the puzzles that we've been puzzling over. And um, so in the first part, I look at the pros and cons of the current position in relation to conscience claims of individuals in employment. I'm looking at the employment context um, largely. And then I go on to look at the at an example of um, states where they do have a duty of reasonable accommodation, the US and Canada. And then I, the third part of the paper looks at whether or not I think that it's the answer for our jurisdiction. So if I start um, just thinking about what we currently have and the pros and cons of that. So currently, issues to do with um, accommodation uh, sorry, it's just to do with conscience, are, are, are dealt with really within our domestic jurisdiction as an indirect discrimination claim. So the Dell says that your, your requirement that I must carry out civil partnership puts me at a disadvantage as a Christian who doesn't uh, support gay marriage and therefore you must <coughs> justify the disadvantage you put me in. And the court does justify. But it's framed as an indirect discrimination claim. McFarlane's the same. Your requirement on me that applies to everybody that you must give um, psychosexual therapy to anybody who comes to couples uh, puts him at a disadvantage. So it's an indirect discrimination claim. And I, in my opinion, it does the job reasonably well as a, as a framework. Um, it covers most of the conscience claims we might think of that would arise at work. So somebody saying, I don't want to serve pork or I don't want to serve alcohol. Uh, you would say, okay, that's a requirement that applies to everybody, it puts you at a disadvantage as a Muslim, and uh, the employers justify it. And then when you're looking at justification, you take into account, it's quite a flexible concept, it can take into account a lot of things, it can take into account, uh, have you just applied yourself as a, for a job as a butcher in a sort of sausage shop, in which case it probably isn't disproportionate for the employer to refuse to employ you, or if you've applied for a job in a pub, you know, that's the core of your job. If I was required, um, I probably, I'm, I'm requested rather than required each year to um, come along and meet first year undergraduates and we tend to have some wine there. And if I said I'm not serving that wine, I think it would be disproportionate of my employer to say we're not employing you as, a, uh, as an academic because you won't serve wine for one Thursday evening in the year. And of course it would be disproportionate and so my conscience claim would be supported. So indirect discrimination sort of uh, does, the, does the trick, the proportionality concept has got a, a, an inbuilt flexibility and um, ability to, to, to pick up nuance in the case and it can take into account is it public sector, is it not public sector, etc, etc. So it works quite well. Um, the idea of a duty of accommodation can also be incorporated in within our proportionality equation and we can see that starting to infiltrate. So uh, Lady Hale mentioned it in the Hall and Bull case saying actually in order to assess whether or not it was a proportionate response to turn down the request for um, or to, to insist on the requirement we can take into account whether or not the employer was prepared to do a, a reasonable accommodation so actually it's already sort of we've already sort of got it but in a rather indirect way and you also see that in um, the most recent court of um, justice cases from the eu in the ashbita case they said one of the issues in relation to proportionality is whether or not there was an attempt to, or whether they could have thought about accommodating the request. So a duty of accommodation is sort of uh, folded in within our indirect discrimination claim. Um, so that's the sort of, it, it roughly works. We can contest, I'm not really looking at the outcomes of the case, I'm just thinking about structures, if you like, and as a structure we can see that it works. But there are some downsides to it. Uh, one is the concept of the individual claim. So the whole thing, the, the problem with indirect discrimination is that in a weed, the Court of Appeal decided that you have to be part of a group. When we looked at that earlier this, this morning, uh, the group claim. Um, and therefore, if you're just one, 
then you may not be able to bring your claim because you can't show there's a group of you who are disadvantaged. Now, I in the paper I, I set out my argument for why I think that they um, don't need to follow that route anymore if we use an indirect discrimination claim. I think following the AWIDA decision at the European Court of Human Rights and the Human Rights Act, which means that we have to interpret our law to comply, I think it's quite plausible to um, I, to interpret our indirect discrimination law to comply. Indirect discrimination law says um, that something was put or puts or would put a person with the same belief at a disadvantage. And it seems to me that the would puts is in the conditional tense. You just add in the words would put if there was anybody, uh, persons who shared that belief. Um, that argument was put to the Court of Appeal and they rejected it and said it stretches the meaning too much. But it seems to me under the Human Rights Act, we can stretch the meaning. And so I think that's a, 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 a counter argument. The case of Mbar said, sort of seems to have looked at it, but actually they do concede in it that they didn't hear argument on it. So I'm holding out a little bit of hope that we can still make that argument if, if it actually came to it. The other thing is that it's rare that nobody else shares the belief. The problem for a weeder was an entirely practical one. I don't think the legal team had necessarily thought about the point, and so um, they didn't come with evidence of where's her group. And so the court just said, well, you didn't identify, but they didn't say it would have been impossible for you to. They just, it just happened that she hadn't, and I think it was a convenient way of disposing of her case without having to decide it. Um, so I, I still think that there's a, there's a way out of that sort of dead end on groups. The other problem, though, with indirect discrimination is that it's not very clear. You have to be quite a well uh, schooled lawyer to get that in, this is actually an indirect discrimination claim. If you're somebody who says, can I ask my employer to opt out of serving wine at the freshers do, you've got to say, well actually yes you probably can. Now let me explain. It's called indirect discrimination. They've applied it. You know, it's complicated. It's not clear on the face of it and people don't know that they have that right. Um, there's also a problem with indirect discrimination which is that it um, has it runs a danger of um, of a levelling down of equality law if we take it as an equality strand. So indirect discrimination on grounds of sexual orientation, sex, race um, is pretty strict. You have to have, it's quite hard to justify indirect race discrimination. You're certainly not going to be able to say clients don't like it or uh, it's expensive. Think of how much money we expect employers to spend to support uh, women who are pregnant. You know, we, we, we have really high standards of what we expect employers to do in order to protect the equality rights of their staff on those other grounds. And I'm not sure there's an appetite for us to respect so much for the accommodation of religion at work. And so if the courts start to say, well, yeah, actually, it would have been a bit expensive, wouldn't it, to buy a new fridge for this person who needs a separate fridge for their non-meat something, something. You know, the employers might, we might end up saying that we can justify the, what we now know is indirect discrimination of refusing to do that. If we start to la allow uh, cost to justify, for example, other colleagues not liking it or whatever it is, um, that could have the pay, that could lead to leveling down of indirect discrimination standards elsewhere in our quality framework. So the downs, so the, the pros in favour of the indirect discrimination approach is it sort of works, and the downside is it's not clear. There's a little problem. There's a potential problem over it, individuals, and it runs the risk of cross contamination of with the rest of equality law, which has a slightly different. Um, buy-in by society, I think. So that leads everyone to the question, would reasonable accommodation be the answer? Would that solve these problems? So if we have a think about what happens in the states where they do that, um, how does it work? Well, the US and Canada both have a duty of accommodation. I, I, the paper explains quite how it works. But the basic idea is that religious individuals can ask for an accommodation of religious practice and the employer must accommodate it up until the point it reaches undue hardship. So a lot of people think this is the answer, it avoids the individual, it's clear and you separate it off from the rest of equality law by you don't get cross-contamination because you're not, it's not like the rest of the equality grounds, it's now in, it's got its own separate category. Um, but my, um, the argument that I 
make in the paper is that actually the framework is only as strong as the, uh, the, the protection for the right to reasonable accommodation is only as strong as the court's understanding of what's reasonable and what is undue hardship. So if we take the United States example, their level of hardship is really quite low. You can very easily, they sort of give with one hand a right to accommodation and they take it straight back again by saying, as soon as there's a problem, it's undue hardship and your case sort of dissolves. Um, that's not, it's a little bit too glib to, to summarise it as that. You do have to have a hardship. You can't just come up with a hypothetical hardship. Um, and there must be economic hardship and not just sort of spiritual hardship. So there's a case called Townley Engineering where the employer wanted to run the business along Christian lines and uh, argued that the, uh, they used to send out gospel tracts with their outgoing mail and print Bible verses on their invoices and things. And the employer said if they were to accommodate an atheist in their workplace by excusing him from attending the weekly services, it would cause a sort of spiritual hardship to the organisation and that wasn't accepted. It had to be an economic hardship. So that it does it does have some content, this right. Um, and um, but in a, in the um, case, the uh, Trans World Airlines case in Harvison, which sort of sets the standard, this was somebody who wanted to um, be allowed some time off for religious observance and they, um, it was going to mess up their uh, shift system and other workers would have been upset by it and the court said actually if we accommodate your shift pattern we're going to put other people at an inconvenience and they won't like it and that was enough hardship. <coughs> so basically it's pretty a low, low level hardship. Second case they said the fact that the employee could identify lots of other ways they could have accommodated him wasn't enough as well. That doesn't, that doesn't give you an automatic right to be accommodated. So um, the fact that the employer would like, can identify lots of other ways that they could make, the, make this work doesn't get you over any sort of um, hurdle. So, as I say, a fairly weak standard um, implied in the, in the States. If we turn to the to Canadian case law, we find a better standard. So they have some statements that say things like, if you've got to um, accommodate it, if, you, if it's possible to accommodate it, um, then you should. But it still says, unless it causes undue hardship. So a couple of writers have got, I think, a little bit overexcited about the potential for indirect, for reasonable accommodation on the basis of this line that says, you've got to accommodate if possible, because the second bit of the sentence says, unless there's undue hardship, so we're back to the same issue. There's still this sort of indeterminate bit for the court to decide was that undue hardship. Um, but the Canadian courts have put a little bit more of a, a, a content to it. It has a substantive and a procedural aspect. The employer needs to have thought about it and show they've thought about it, as well as just um, the question of whether it was reasonable. Um, and employers must be must do more than merely show there's just some impact on their business. They need to, they need, it can be argued that they need to tolerate a certain amount of inconvenience in order to accommodate the religion. So, so what we have is two jurisdictions using the reasonable accommodation model with quite different, not quite different, but different standards of protection, which proves my contention that it's not the model that is important. It's not this panacea that you know, if we just introduce duty of accommodation, suddenly all of our issues are going to disappear and that this is the right, this is the answer. So, despite the, so I would never claim that the duty of accommodation would sort of solve all the problems. Um, but that then uh, leads to the, to the third part of the paper that looks at having set out that stall, if you like, do, what, where do we go? Do we think that the, do, do I think that the duty of accommodation would, would help? Quite a few people do. There's been quite a lot of um, groups suggesting that we should go down this route. The, the um, Equality and Human Rights Commission have said that they're not favouring it. I was involved in some of that, so that might be not surprised that they came out with that conclusion, but they were very, very clear in the work that I did that they didn't want us to reach a conclusion, and it was their conclusion that they weren't going to press for a, the introduction of a duty of accommodation. But the European Union um, 
funded project Religare comes out on the in favour of a duty of accommodation. And the European Parliament has suggested it, and there's a certain amount of sort of European discussion around it as an idea. So there are people getting behind it as an idea. Um, as I've said, I think in practice it doesn't solve the problem. We still end up, with, we'll just move the debate from when is it proportionate to what, how, how much hardship is undue or what is reasonable. Um, so, so I don't think it's worth making the change just for that reason. What other reasons might there be to, to make the change? Well, it's certainly easier to understand. It's obvious from the face of the right that it, you know, what it is a duty of reasonable accommodation, it seems to me, and it would be quite much easier to explain to people. There's a, a procedural issue about burden of proof that has also diff changes things. Instead of having to say, I've got to identify a neutral rule and then show the disadvantage and show that it's disproportionate, um, you just ask, and then the employer's got to come back with an answer. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's much easier. And... Um, I think it would be easier for individual individuals to claim. You haven't got to show a group. You just say, I don't want to work on Tuesday afternoons. And the employer's going to have to decide what they're going to do about that. Um, whether you're into the reasonableness could be the question of whether you're misguided that the church should, your church should be meeting on Tuesday afternoons. But you can have an individual one-off claim. Um, so in that sense, it's easier. But that very point, leads another set of people to not like this as an approach because it's sort of almost too easy if you like to claim there's a sense that it would be easier to claim because you're not accusing your employer of doing anything wrong so if you bring an indirect discrimination claim you've already started off on a fairly aggressive track haven't you with your manager you know you're discriminating against me by not letting me store my whatever it is in the fridge um it's a much more difficult conversation to have than I wonder if we could have a conversation, I don't like being, you know, I need to be able to have this special shelf in the fridge to store this, or I can't work on Thursday evening serving drinks, can you accommodate me? It's a, it's a much easier conversation, less confrontational. But, um, as uh, has been pointed out by uh, people here, one of the other problems with it is it, it possibly leads to a sort of um, assumption that the answer should be yes, that we should, let's split the difference, um, and maybe gives too many rights to individuals, religious individuals, to uh, expect change at work to be in their workplaces to accommodate around them. And arguably it might give stronger rights to people with sort of um, obdurate beliefs than to people who don't have. You know, the stronger your religious grouping is and the stronger your religious rules are, the more accommodation you suddenly become eligible for, which may, people may not feel too comfortable about. Um, so there are, there are those who, who really feel that it's not the right move. And, and um, the other argument that I, I look at in the paper is, is a concern that if we keep within the equality framework, we've got quite a well theorised and understood and quite a lot of case law already. You know, we've got a big background that we're working from when we're developing what our thinking about how much um, conscience claims should be accommodated at work. If we set off into this other right to reasonable accommodation, we're not entirely sure necessarily the, the legal basis for that or the theoretical basis for that. It could be based on Article 9, right to religious freedom, but we lose some of the, the richness of the thought, I think, and the jurisprudence that we have within our indirect discrimination law. Um, and, and I think that would be um, a pity. Um, and the other thing that, just to sort of finish, is that it occurred to me that some of the people who argue for a right to reasonable accommodation, this links to levelling down, some people want a right to reasonable accommodation to stop the levelling down. They sort of go, well, actually, this religion stuff is going to bring the protection for gender down, so we would let siphon it off and then we can legitimately give it sort of less protection than these other categories. Other people want uh, reasonable accommodation because that what they see is this is the answer to get us better protection so what we really want is a right of reasonable accommodation so we'll get our accommodations and um, so I then decided that we might end up with a duty of reasonable accommodation being brought in by a sort of coalition of chaos where we have <laughs> these two groups actually aligned together and end up introducing it 
um, but actually from an utterly and totally different um, perspectives, because it doesn't, just introducing a right to reasonable accommodation doesn't tell us what we're going to do with it, it doesn't give us any content. We can say duty of accommodation is a duty of accommodation, like Brexit is Brexit, but we don't know what that means. So actually the, a move to, to introduce a duty of accommodation, we can actually get quite a lot of people to agree to, but why they want it and what it might lead to is absolutely unclear. And, and potentially an introduction of it. One of the Equality and Human Rights Reason Commission's reasons for not doing it, I think, was that we would just have to develop another whole set of new case law to tell us what its content was, and we wouldn't get the consistency and coherence that some people feel it would create. So I think, although I, I still sit slightly on the fence over whether we should make that move, my overall feeling is that it wouldn't necessarily create consistency and any greater clarity than we currently have. Um, so I don't commend to you the introduction of a duty of accommodation, but I'm you know, open to argument on it. But anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you.